In our second lesson of the end of me, I want to continue to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus continues to take what we thought we knew about happiness and he turns it completely upside down on his head. The second beatitude goes like this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. Isn't that like another way of saying, happy are the sad? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because from our perspective, happiness comes from our dreams that come true. We think we are going to be happy and we think life is going to be good because we get everything we want. I wonder if the Beatitudes were written to describe how we feel about blessings from our culture and our perspective, it would go something like this. Blessed are you when everything goes your way. Or maybe it would be something like this. Blessed are you when all your dreams come true. Now let me just pause and interrupt myself. I like that Beatitude. Come on, somebody. Yes, let that be so. But when we read, blessed are those who mourn, there's a tendency to squint at it just right so that we can dismiss the poetic language. But the poetry falls apart when you start to give some specifics. So instead of saying, blessed are those who mourn, what if we said this? Blessed is the young widow who raises her small child. Blessed is the person who loses a job. Blessed is the recovering alcoholic who has nothing left. Maybe blessed is the woman whose husband leaves her for someone else. Then it doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? You see, Jesus promises there is a blessing for those in those moments. When life just seems to fall apart, moments of heartbreak, moments of loss, those moments of deep disappointment, the moments when it feels like you've come to the end of yourself. You've come to the end of me. The word that Jesus uses for mourn is the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language. The commentator William Barclay says that mourning that Jesus talks about is not only sorrow, which brings an ache to the heart, but it's sorrow that brings unresistible tears to the eyes. So now the heart is hurting. The eyes are expressing themselves with tears and so it's surprising that suffering would make room for us to know joy. That in suffering we would actually be an overcomer with a deeper understanding of God's presence and His peace. We can find a blessing. Yeah, we typically can't know the blessing without weeping and without mourning. That's what he's trying to tell us, that maybe what precedes the blessing is the mourning and the weeping. There's a blessing that comes when life gets hard. You know what? I don't like that either. Don't tell me that. But wait a minute. It's the Beatitudes. In the Old Testament, there's an example of the blessing that comes in mourning. We, we find the story of Job. Satan was looking forward to Job coming to the end of himself also to the end of his faith, but that's really not what happened. When we meet up with Job, he is living a good life. He's rich, he's happily married, everything seems to be going well for him. 10 children, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. I mean, the list goes on and on of the livestock, not to mention the small army of servants and life is good, hey Job. But then life begins to fall apart. Job begins to experience some suffering. His dream life comes to an end. He loses literally everything. A strong wind knocks down the houses and kills his children. I, I can't even imagine. I, I can't fathom that, that emotion. But then that's just the beginning. The second chapter of Job, he has lost his health. Infested with sores, literally over every inch of his body. He's lost all of his livestock. His wealth is gone and Satan was betting on the fact that Job lost everything, that he would lose his faith in God as well. You know what? The devil bets on a lot of things and thankfully we prevail. Even in Job's 
situation to add insult to injury, maybe to amp up the life of discouragement. Even his wife says to him, just curse God and die. Because what good is God if he doesn't even work out and doesn't even fix things? But it turns out that Job experienced a blessing. He knew God in a way that he never had known God before. Job said in the middle of all of his loss, this is kind of amazing, watch. He said to God, my ears have heard you before, but now my eyes have seen you. Wow, my ears have heard you before, but now my eyes have seen you? Maybe this is Job's mechanism to process life. And here's what we find in our suffering, the deep void that used to be filled by whatever we lost. It could be stuff from a job, a relationship. None of these things are bad things, but those things are gone and it leaves us with an aching cavity. And God is there to fill up that achiness with himself. So when we suffer, we mourn. When we mourn, we are comforted by God's presence. So blessed are those who mourn. Of course, we do anything we can to avoid suffering. Of course, we want to stay away from all kinds of personal difficulty or disappointment. Yes, we do. But inevitably, we are going to experience our share of suffering. When we experience it, we tend to stay away from the mourning. So when we can find ourselves and reach to ourselves, we do everything within our power to make it go away. We numb ourselves with entertainment. We medicate the pain to go away with drinking or shopping or working or partying. We may even have to suffer, but nobody's gonna make us mourn, right? So we try to shift our efforts by just getting over it. We wanna get past it. Let's just move past this. We wanna get around it. We wanna just move around from the broken heart, the wrecked relationships, the debilitating regret of a disastrous decision or the impossible opinions of a serious illness. We want to just move away. Life, leave me alone. I was fine till you showed up. But what I've learned that when we're living in denial and blaming others or basking in the guilt, it's no way to live. It's stressful, it's pressure, it's angry emotions. Instead, when we turn to God, we find a blessing in those difficult moments. So at the end of yourself, you, me, we, we have an opportunity to express and experience the presence of God in a way that we never could have done before. So I say in all of this, thank you, God, for never leaving me. I say in all of this, thank you, God, that we have an understanding, a revelation of the Beatitudes that you preached on the mountain that day. Thank you for caring for us in advance. I pray that this lesson will speak to where you are in life today and that the takeaway will be a word of encouragement, a word of faith, and that together with the Spirit of God, we all shall be conquerors. Praise God in Jesus' name. This is so.